Can I get him? working you guys is that good am i good here all right a couple more questions and then we'll get started um we have about a minute according to my uh, phone uh, some of the tools that i'm going to be covering uh are are two tools that i really spend a lot of time on are um loadstorm and the new relic are you guys using new relic okay so it's it's it sounds like by hands of, or looks like it's about a third as well. Or you're heavily concentrated in that. It's about a third of New Relic users, right? Uh, what are other tools that you're using if you're not using New Relic? Xhprof. Okay. Xhprof. Jmeter. That for this for load testing. Okay. What about so load testing tools other than load? Have has anybody heard of Loadstorm? Okay, cool. Has anybody used the new version? You guys use the new the new version? Okay, cool. I'm going to talk a lot about that. I, I just use that tool. I'm, it's, it's, a, it's a nice tool, but I'm sure there are others, and I've used others that are uh, probably equally as good. Uh, so other load testing tools, JMeter, Siege. Oh, yes, yeah, Siege. That's it's an oldie but goodie. Any, anything else? Which one? Blitz, uh, what's the is that the one that uh, comes with the Acquia uh, subscription? Okay, well I think I'm gonna get started. Um, let me set my. So again, thank you for coming. Um, I've planned 45 minutes. If we have, um, we're covering through a lot of stuff um, that we're gonna get. Um, get you guys out of here a little bit sooner, particularly if you don't have any questions. Um, so, and again, thank you so much for coming. Um, so my objectives were pretty simple. I've uh, talked about performance, and uh, that's something I really enjoy about uh, Drupal. I've been around in IT before Drupal, uh, so it's kind of like a personal hobby and interest of mine. Um, and so what I did is I, I tried to, um, we've load tested other other uh, sites and, and, and our normal jobs. And I wanted to take something that I can really present to the community and kind of uh, break down uh, in MythBusters mode uh, what works and what doesn't work, or, or what are some of the what are some of the results that we've had on a pretty standard install and a pretty standard set of test cases, which hopefully you can take away and find and see what really works. Right? I mean, obviously that's not going to work for every case. Every Drupal site is different. Every Drupal site is going to have different set of performance problems. But if we're going to talk about generalities, and if you're you know kicking around things like everybody said, memcache, varnish. Um, it, I thought it would be interesting to see what actually they, what, what kind of improvements they actually have, and what kind of impact they have on a pretty typical setup. Um, so that's kind of what we did. We stood up a, a site, stress tested, built a script, stress tested it, looked at results, uh, made an improvement, and repeat. So that's kind of what this talk is about. It's pretty straightforward. Hopefully, it's somewhat interesting. Um, so what I think, what I like everyone to take away is how to take a look at and what to think about when you're looking at test, stress test results. Um, and also, and again, this is particular to how you test, which is, almost, which is equally important as what you test. What are some of the improvements that we found to be, have most impact? Does that sound like what you came in here for? Awesome. Well, thanks. So uh, a little bit about me, that's me. I'm not a scuba diver, that's me biking in Chicago. Um, I, I, I do like to bike in the winter, although a lot of my colleagues are a lot tougher. Uh, it was like minus 20 and they kept on biking. It's, it's uh, very impressive. So uh, oh, by the way, I made it very easy for everyone to follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is A. Koharski. Probably don't even need to write that down, it just rolls off the tongue. Um, I work, I'm a founder and president of Promet Source. We're a Drupal firm, just like many others here. Uh, we do focus really on, on DevOps, and we, we cook with Chef, and we provide support. Um, we've been around since 2003, 
And uh, did I mention we're in Chicago? We're in Chicago. And of, thanks, some of you pro Metsters, for coming, Melissa. Um, I want to give a big shout out to a few folks from my team that really, really helped me out. Basically, um, they did all of the work. Um, so that's uh, Kabla, Vincent, and Greg. They're on our team um, in SysOps or, or, or Dev in Dev or in uh, SysOps. Um, so they're they're really great, and um, I couldn't have done it without them. Like I really couldn't have done this without them. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Scott Price, who is the CEO of Loadstorm. Again, I'm not here to kind of push a Loadstorm um, uh, tool, but uh, he has been instrumental and has helped me tremendously uh, looking at and analyzing some of the results uh, when I mentioned that I'm going to be using his tool. So, uh, Scott, if you watch this on um, recorded video, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Okay, so a couple of things of what this is not. We're going to get to the good stuff in a couple of minutes. Um, what load testing is not is it's not front-end performance testing, right? So we're not looking at improving your web page load um, as it loads without, without any stress on your site, right? That's very important. I highly encourage everyone to do that, but that's not what we're doing here. It's also not high availability analysis, right? So somebody said add more servers. Absolutely, that will increase your performance. However, it is not testing your high availability. High availability gets tested when something gets broken. If you've heard of Chaos Monkey, or if you haven't, I highly suggest you look it up. It's a, it's a, it's a methodology used by Netflix to uh, inflict pain and make sure that they survive any kind of unexpected um, events. Uh, so why load test? Uh, capacity planning. Uh, if you're expecting a big event, if you're expecting a uh, spike in traffic, if you're expecting to uh, partner up with somebody who's going to send you a lot of traffic and you have some kind of an estimation, it also allows you to uh, state what you can handle. Um, performance tuning is done on a page and by page basis. XHREF obviously does a lot that, of that for you. Tools like Devel help you uh, increase uh, or improve your page performance. That's very important. I, I have found that certain sites behave differently under load, so we have been able to ha take some lessons learned uh, from that. And I have one little story um, before I jump into uh, data, and that is I found this study really fascinating. I, I came across it at the Velocity Conference. By the way, um, Velocity Conference is amazing. If you haven't uh, gone to that, I highly recommend it. It's, it's all about web, uh, making the web stronger. Um, but Strange Loop is a, a company that, that presented this uh, case study. They're a um, performant. They, they are in web performance and all aspects of web performance from, from network delivery to DNS to uh, application improvement. And what they did is they talked a large e-commerce uh, partner or client of theirs into allowing them to take a small percentage of their traffic during all throughout uh, a period of time and delay it and then measure results. Uh, it's amazing. Whoever, whoever talked them into it is amazing. And, and, the, and the findings were really fascinating. So um, as you can see, in half a second delay, so you, they started noticing um, in, an impact right away from a two, from basically a point two second 200 millisecond delay, page views started dropping. And then it was kind of consumer behavior, right, on this e-commerce site. With half a second, their bounce rates um, went up, their conversion went down, their page views went down, and it, when you delayed it uh, by um, almost a second, their cart site started going down. So performance has a big impact on human uh, interaction with your site. So always keep that in mind. So some concepts, I'm sure most of everyone has probably seen this. This is a waterfall diagram of, of a, a HTML object. Uh, the, the, the horizontal axis the, is the time it takes for all the objects to, or any of the objects to, uh, to the time it takes for it to download to your uh, browser. Um, the vertical axis is the number of objects on a page. So in this case, you always want to have a short, x-axis and a, and, a, and a short y-axis 
things on the x-axis, things loading faster on the y-axis, small number of objects. This will also impact your performance testing uh, as you have less objects that your server has to respond to. It will be able to turn pages, turn through pages quickly, and um, you can do things like offload things to CDN, uh, which will also allow it to uh, respond faster. Further, you can break down each one of these objects into their own performance, um, uh, into each individual performance. I wanted to mention this because we are not uh, going to talk about SSL in this part. However, uh, SSL negotiation does have an impact, especially on e-commerce site e sites, and I think generally now, whenever you have a site that has a login, it's generally accepted to have an SSL uh, certificate installed, so you, so you, you can't uh, pick up that traffic. But it starts from DNS lookup to initial connection, how long does it take for the server to process that re the request and send you a response, and then also how long does it take to, take to have that content download. So these are the basics. Uh, the one other thing to keep in mind is um, generally when you have a lot of your uh, static objects offloaded off your server, when you're talking about performance on the server side, you're only mostly talking about impacting the first HTML or a few objects that are being processed on that application server. So the backend performance generally is that first request. Most of the other things can be, imp can be greatly uh, uh, improved on the front end. So uh, striping images, reducing the size of um, your objects, uh, combining them, and so on. Does that make sense? Okay, so just want to get the, 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 the basics down. We're going to talk about uh, the performance stuff now. So if anybody's interested, the site is still up. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we used LoadStorm, Commerce Kickstart, which is a Commerce Guys uh, uh, Drupal distribution for commerce. It comes ready loaded with, um, with products. And we use New Relic to analyze the, uh, re the server uh, performance or, or what it was happening on the server as we're load testing um, these, uh, load testing the site. And you can take a look again. This URL should be open. If anybody's tried it and it's closed, let me know. Um, but if it's not, we'll keep this site around for a couple of weeks after the presentation if you want to take a look at the PHP configuration and everything that's on that um, that this was running. This is a, just a, an Amazon instance that's going to get blown away. Okay, so here's our victim. This is the Commerce Kickstart out of the box. Here's what it looks like on a home page. It's pretty quick, uh, 37 objects. It doesn't have anything uh, terribly heavy on it. It doesn't have, a lot of, doesn't have any... Um, uh, the other important thing about this page is it doesn't have a lot of uh, objects that are that call things from the outside. Um, during load testing, we wouldn't be able to do that unless we get authenticated anyway. But generally speaking, you want to you want to know you want to make sure you have anything that you reference that that you have no control over. You put that to the bottom of your HTML. Okay, so uh, load test is uh, load testing is. is is comprised of steps, which are uh, basically a step is generally a click on a page or opening up a home page, and then a series of these steps uh, takes a, builds a scenario, and then what we do is we take those scenarios and we plan a, t a test. So this is really important, but I only have one or two slides on it because it basically stays constant. But when you build your load plan or your load testing plan, what you're trying to do is assume or, or basically simulate the traffic that you're going to expect when you expect the highest uh, peak of, of usage, right? And this is key uh, because if you, if you, the results are going to be very, very, very different if you we make certain assumptions that do not reflect the reality of your traffic. Most importantly is whether you're testing with anonymous users or authenticated users. That is, that, that basic, if we change, if I were to take this test and change around the percentage of distribution between anonymous and authenticated, 
m most of these findings will be completely different and invalidated. Um, so this is for this type of test. So let's take a look what we did. So what I've done is I've built four scripts. So four scripts was basically, basically think of that as four different types of users that are, that are hitting your site. My first script, which we run 70% of the time, so when we s fire up our test, we give that a weight of 70%. That means that 70% of the users, as I'm incrementing the users, are going to be running script one, which is basically an anonymous browser. It's somebody jumping in, hitting the home page, hitting a couple products, and then bouncing out. Script number two is a login of a user, six page views, log out. Script number three, somebody logs in, puts a product in cart, and then bounces. And then script number four, this is, a, this is the one that uh, is the key script for this case, is the script is a user that logs in, puts two products in a cart, and starts the checkout process. So inputs information to the checkout process and goes into the next screen. Uh, Loadstorm, or sorry, um, Commerce uh, Kickstarter saves that information into the database. So I'm able to view that information into the database. So um, the reason why this is key, and I'll probably repeat this multiple times, is as we're getting, as we're implying, as we're applying certain uh, tools to improve performance, some of them really benefit anonymous users, for example, like views. Some of them Im impact non-logged uh, in users. So if you change your tests around, you change your assumptions around, you're going to get different results. Our target environment was a single CPU, medium um, instance at Amazon. That's it. There's nothing else about this slide. Okay. So the second thing that we're trying to do is determine breakpoint, right? So how do you determine breakpoint under a stress test scenario? Actually, that's a question for you. Like, how would you determine a question? Uh, how would you determine breakpoint? Server timeout. Server timeout. Okay, great. So when you get a, fi when you get a 500 or a 502, you get, that's, that's it, we have a problem. That's, how else can you define it? Or how else do you guys define it? Look, okay, perfect, yes. So you can say, my goal is to make sure that I, m my pages or my, or my response, object response, doesn't hit a certain threshold, and I'm going to, I'm going to define what is acceptable to me. Um, so, there are, there are different ways of defining it, and actually, this was a, this was an exercise that we went through a couple of times around because we kept on finding breakpoints, we kept on finding some things acceptable, and 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 we looked at you know load average, and we found that our little server was performing at you know twenty a load of twenty, it was still sending responses that were acceptable to the users. We had that insight, um, so we decided, or I should say, I decided that. Um, we're going to look at and determine that we have a break. We have, we have reached an unacceptable response time, or SLA, when the average response time to all the objects is greater than a second. We have errors, an error rate of greater than 0.5%. And my home page on, load, on the first script takes more than 10 seconds to load. Those are just my definitions. They don't have to be yours, but I found that through running my test and repeating and looking at them, uh, this was an easy gauge for me to say, okay, now I know that with this performance, I can, uh, we can have this many page views or we can have these many visitors before I break my SLA promise to my client or to my boss or to myself. Does that make sense? Right, so we're going to use this all the time. These can also vary, so if you set your error rate to be zero, then you're going to get different results, right? But we are a little bit more tolerant. Uh, it all depends on you. But, but setting these goals in the, in the beginning is very important because as you're testing them, then you'll find out, you can say with some level of confidence, we know that we can take this much traffic with, and the server will do this based on this type of traffic.
based, sorry, based on this type of user uh, profile uh, behavior. All right, so here we go. This is gonna be lots and lots of graphs. Baseline, out of the box install, no optimization, no optimization, no caching. Um, we started a load test with 250 users. Any wagers on how far we got before we reached an unacceptable criteria? My goodness, that was spot on. <laughs> Sir, you should come up here and help me out. Okay, so we hit, um, so a couple of things about this graph. This is a load storm graph. Uh, it gives me a lot of information and it can be a little bit, let me see if I can show you what this looks like. Um, live demo, be kind. Okay, so here's a test on a, um, We're going to be seeing a lot of these, so I just want to. Um... Okay, so the the bl light blue line gives you an idea of how many users I have. So if I, I at a given time, so I'm going to start my test at 50 or something. I'm going to, through time as time goes up, it's going to go up. Uh, so this is the blue line indicates how many users I'm hitting the site with. The next thing that I like to take a look at to start seeing where my problems occur is the peak response time. Now remember, I did not set a failure, at, uh, I didn't set a failure criteria for a peak response time being over a certain time. However, when I see this thing going over 15 seconds, I know that something is failing on the server because LoadStorm tells me that it did not get a response or it's still waiting indefinitely. Basically, it stops waiting for it after 15 seconds and you can set that parameter. The next thing that I'm going to take a look at are errors. Now, um, I did have some errors that I did not remove in my script. So I, so if you guys look at this, this is what we did. I removed those errors and um, it allows me to get rid of them. And the, and the last thing that I really pay attention to is the yellow line, which gives me the average response time to all of my objects, okay? So when you see this graph, um, you can see that it's not really looking that pretty. And pretty would basically mean that everything follows this blue line. And I can see that initially on load, it, it had a problem loading some of the first pages. Um, and basically I had non -res I had non-responses, oops, starting right here. And as I kind of pen, drag my cursor around this line, I knew, I see the first, at 59 users, I hit my 2% errors and 1.2 1 seconds average response time. So that's kind of what we're using to determine when we have a failure and we've reached our limit. Does that make sense? How do you define errors? How do I define errors? Great question. So, whoops. Basically, no, this is a bad example. Errors are basically anything that comes back from a server that's not a 404. I mean, that's, the, that's really the, um, the easy response. Let me give you something that has a lot of errors. So at a certain point where um, your server starts degrading and it's gonna start throwing all kinds of errors at you. So here we have, and I turn off 403s per my internal agreement with myself. I do not count those as errors because I um, know that I can get rid of those. Uh, they're due to, to the Drupal Commerce, um, Drupal Commerce install out of the box has some 404s force and due to my script. So just please ignore those I, and put your trust in me. Um, so these are the, the, generally these are the things that we've seen, uh, bad gateway, request timeout, request connection timeout. So basically the server starts being too busy to accept connections or starts tripping over itself.
Um, let's see. So actually, that was I had it in here. So here are some errors. Uh, the other graph that I look at at LoadStorm still is at one point does my home page start taking more than 10 seconds to respond, and I call that um, I call that as a failure too. So let's take a look at what's happening on New Relic. So this uh, little cloud server really started getting overwhelmed very quickly. Uh, it went up to 100 load. Uh, load is basically a measure of how many processes are waiting for your CPU behind the current process. Uh, generally, 100 is a server that's you can't probably SSH into it. It's 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 pretty bad. Um, However, amazingly, it still kept on responding throughout this process. Just um, it tried to do what it did, but we stopped it probably around around here. We called it around here. Uh, so what was happening? What are some of the top transactions? Um, actually, uh, one other thing I wanted to point out is that PHP was our limiter here. Um, on the application side, so New Relic allows you to take a look at what's happening on the application side. Uh, the image style deli deliver, views page, um, node page view, just the typical standard Drupal operations we're timing out, or, or we're using up all of our resources. Um, and the shopping cart and collections of, of products are the largest uh, CPU uh, consumers. So we turned on Drupal Cache. That was a no-brainer. So what we did, what I did actually, is to measure and compare what we were able to get from baseline to subsequent improvements is uh, come up with a number that gives us, based on the number of users at, at which, at the point where the failure occurred, we took that number and extrapolated how many users we could have. We could the site could sustain in an hour, right? That's kind of a more of a of a number that uh, uh, somebody making business decisions uh, can understand, right? Not not to talk down to any to, to that, but I can if you can say I am able to sustain 150 or you know a thousand users an hour. That's a number that you can think through, right? How many users? Because you can think through how many users am I, how many users am I get from search, from referral links. You can take a look at history, your Google Analytics, and see what the spike can be expected. So, turning Drupal cache on, cache on is basically the biggest improvement. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. That's a very obvious thing. However, it it's it's also uh, important to know that a lot of the 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 thing the advantages that Drupal cache on gives you, Drupal cache gives you. Um, so actually, not all of the advantages that Drupal Cache gives you are uh, used by logged in users. So, here is our famous uh, or a graph that we're going to look at a lot. Again, we can see that we're at 265 users. That's pretty good, or much better, I should say. The uh, thing to note here is that uh, my point of failure for the average response time was at 265. My point of failure on the errors was a 290. And something interesting happened here, which I'm going to go through. Uh, something really bad happened around minute 40 of this test. Something was happening. Uh, as you can see, I had a pretty reasonable, well, it's actually not unreasonable for normal, but normal um, or a normalized load. And then something happens uh, at this point. Although, even though my CPU usage was already maxed out pretty early on, really a big, um, I can see that my PHP is consuming, uh, or uh, memory, con consuming a lot more memory at this point. When I look at my overview on New Relic of web transaction response times, huge failure. Also, throughput went down. So basically, I had a failure during my test. Um, it looks like there's some cache field that was being refreshed at this point. Um, I had a cache field insert event happening here. Uh, lots of insert time being spent here and then delete time being spent here. So basically in invalidated my test. We, the other thing that I should mention is we run our load tests at least three times. 
Unfortunately, that wasn't so great for me preparing for my presentation because we run it for about three hours, which means it took days and days to get Valerie's <laughs> results, and I didn't have that much. However, it's, re it's really key because it, we really found a lot of anomalies from test to test, and we basically took and look at, looked at them and see, okay, what can we really expect in the real world? Was there something happening that gave me an invalid result? <laughs> Like, like here. So we ran it, we ran it. Luckily we, we had uh, three of them. We found another one. Um, actually, the real number was um, 154, and that's the result. We have normalized uh, the humpback whale, I call this the top, top memory consumers and CPU consumers, uh, jumps up pretty quickly. So this rise was pretty steep. You, you don't want that, you want that to be gradual. Views is consuming most of the memory. So let's get at memcache. All right, memcache should give us a pretty good boost in this case. Why? Because we're, yes? Yes. Yeah, by. The question was, uh, when I turned on Drupal Cache, I was using a database to store cache. Yes, by default, Drupal 7 stores cache information in a database. It's a very bad idea. Well, I shouldn't say it was a bad idea. It's bad for performance. And what I, I couldn't hear your other question. Yes, so we have a pretty good improvement in Memcache. Why? Because Memcache uh, pulls stuff, it, it basically eliminates database. The, the from the slide where we talked about what kind of tests we have, although 70% of our tests are uh, anonymous users, 30% of them are not. So 30% of them uh, bypass reverse proxy and all kinds of caches from, um, from Drupal, and they interact with the database as they're adding cart shopping, especially when they add uh, products to their cart. We're doing direct inserts into the database. So this graph is starting to look better. It's starting to look more uh, normal. Our SLA goes, uh, goes up to 253 users. Is anybody surprised or not surprised by the M Memcache finding? Is this along with your experiences? If we can take a look at the top five uh, processes on the server, um, it's still PHP is our limiter. Uh, CPU consumer, PHP is by high, by far the highest consumer. So we are bound by that CPU on the PHP side. What's happening here, though, that's nice, is that um, we have more runway before the clips, right? So our our humpback <coughs> excuse me, our humpback whale is uh, is is getting a tail. <laughs> I didn't practice that. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> so. Um, we have more runway here. Uh, this isn't, you know, this this is not catastrophic in, immediately. Uh, that's good. You can see that it starts the, that our, our our problems start happening right around here. Memcache is engaged. Uh, still, PHP is using most of our resources or taking l l most time to respond. Here, a node page view. So it's still views that's causing uh, most of the delays. I was actually a little bit surprised by that because I thought that it would be uh, the inserts, um, but but it's not. Maybe it's because it's just 10% of the time. But uh, our homepage, no page view, uh, and then commerce cart, that is, um, that's always going to be a problem in this e-commerce site because it pulls every page view. Uh, there, the commerce cart um, module gives y our users an indicator of how many items they have in the cart. So it, it, it must be checking it in the database and it pulling it from there. Uh, if you look at top five modules in Drupal and New Relic, it gives you views, social menu items, and then co commerce product reference. Okay, um, so before, we, yes. You know, actually, I'll hold off on long, I'll, I'm gonna wrap up pretty fast. Um, Hopefully in 15 minutes, leaves us 15 minutes for questions. So the next thing that we did, um, one of the uh, general good practices for Drupal, again, we try to eliminate database, 
is to stop writing your system logs into the database. We want to write it into a file or a third part, some kind of a third party system. So stop doing inserts into the database. So we expected some improvement on that. Okay, any other, any wager, wagers on how much improvement we've seen from that? A lot. That's what I thought, but we didn't. So I really thought this was going to be huge, and this is a surprise finding of ours. And again, this is with the type of tests that we were running, right? We were putting stuff in their cart 10% of the time and doing a bunch of cart shopping browsing 70% of the time. We had absolutely, we, see, we saw absolutely zero, and we, we ran this three times, right? So it wasn't like a fluke. We ran every test three times. We saw absolutely or negligent, neg negligible uh, improvement on um, performance or number of users that that's that that's fail for um, error rates and um, uh, average error response. However, the home page kept on responding under 10 seconds a little bit longer. So I uh, haven't dove in and analyzed why that was happening. I expected a lot more. We got a little bit. So I didn't, I didn't, because it was such a negligent, it wasn't a big improvement, we didn't dive into the findings. So let's go to the next improvement. Okay, so the next thing that we did, we had problems with views, but I didn't cache views yet. What I did is I turned off views UI. Now, a lot of you guys said your system admins, you, you guys probably really don't want anybody using views UI, right, on their live site. Uh, developers, probably not either. Why don't you just use features? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of marketers and communications directors really like Views UI because they probably treat it as content. So this may be a controversial move. However, Views UI, turning that off, had a, okay, I kind of spoiled it, a pretty big impact. I was very, very surprised by this. This is um, almost a 40 performance improvement by just turning Views UI off. So you can see we're getting further here. Uh, the graph is starting to look better and better. We're at 352, whoops, 352 users. Um, I pointed this out here. Uh, I thought this was pretty interesting. So we're, we are uh, getting, we, we're breaking things down at um, some, somewhere around 15 load. That's, that's like, um, I didn't, so I know this says two CPU, let's ignore that because we switched that, we switched that machine when I was taking these screenshots, but when the test ran, it was at one CPU machine. So one CPU machine, you know, it was always working just fine at over 10 load. Um, that was something of a surprise for me. Generally, we try to keep it at half, that's even too much, right? If it's, if it's at, if your load is at the number of CPUs that you have, that's generally a warning sign. So this thing was able to respond, um, uh, keep on responding at 10. The other, the other thing that I don't know if anybody's mentioned, noticed this on this screen, this is, a, this is an Amazon thing. Do you see a problem with the CPU usage here? Or something that you would not be happy if you were using this computer server? Like 50% of our CPU time is stolen. So that means that it's going to maintaining that virtual, machine, virtual environment. Okay, so our, does anybody else call, call this a humpback, humpback whale, whale graph? No? Uh, this is looking much better, right? Um, kind of looks like it though, right? Gotta give it to me. Getting much better. Um, PHP still, like we haven't been able to get around it. PHP, um, this is, oh, this is Nginx, uh, not Apache, so Apache, you have, but it's still PHP processor, it's still taking a lot of time. It does have caching enabled. It did have, a, we did check, it did have a pretty good hit rate. It was still uh, consuming, that was our limiter on this, on this one CPU server. Views, still uh, using a lot of it. Social menu items, uh, not too far behind. Um, on a database side, the commerce order is now starting to come in. That was, that was, uh, uh, that was, a, that's something that we're seeing a lot. So the commerce order, so for the developers in here, what would you start doing now? You would either ask the sysadmin guys to pump more machines at this problem, or they would say, 
let's figure out where, why can we optimize this query? Why is this query consuming so much of, of the database resources? Okay, so now we have a silver bullet, reverse proxy. Anyone, anyone want to wager on how much improvement we had on a reverse proxy? One order of magnitude. Two? Fifty percent. Shockingly, none. Okay, so I really thought about this. Why am I not having a huge impact? I think it's the way we set up our tests. Um, I think it's because what's happening, let's see if I can show this. Okay. So I thought about this. This is, I really expected a lot as well, right? I mean, everybody says the first thing you got to do, put a proxy, reverse proxy in front of it. All of your problems are going to be solved forever and ever, right? Um, well, they're not in this case. And why are they not solved in this case? Why are we still having failures um, at 364 users, which is not much more than we had before? So I looked at this graph and I thought, okay, well, what is this? What's happening here? Why am I having this? You know, I'm getting some responses that are taking a really long time. What, what are they doing here? And so what I did, this is, this is tricky. It doesn't look so cool when you do it on them. Um, I'll show you how this looks on a graph. Um, well. So... Again, I'm not trying to sell Loadstorm, but this is a pretty cool tool. So what it allows me to do, remember that um, my script number four was the script that did most of the heavy insert, insertion and work, right? So what I did is I selected, it only gives me statistics on, on, on script number four. That's the one that has a logged in user and starts inserting stuff into the database. In this random test that I selected, you can see that it immediately has um, it starts jumping up in errors and starts jumping up in average response as to compare to all of these scripts, which, by the way, are not way heavily or evenly, right, because they, one of them runs 70% of the time. So when looking at the fourth script, which runs 10% of the time, it seems to me that um, when this is this blue line is the number of users here, as this next batch of users, whoops, where's my cursor? Next batch of users starts loading up, it, they start writing orders into the database, and the database must get choked up here. So it's, what we've defined as our point of failure is number of errors and number of an average response time. Well, it must be pushing up, it's pushing up that average response time because of this particular script up overall. So that's why we have that point of failure. So remember when at the beginning when I said it's really important to think about what kind of test scripts you're writing against your application. If we only had anonymous, I am sure that that would make a huge improvement. Oh, by the way, another fun fact. So we had a we had another. Um, this is what this is. Um, New Relic, um, looking at web transaction response time. Something was happening here. So it actually is not valid to us anymore, but um, something, ha we had a pretty big failure here. Um, and it looks like we had a flood insert. I didn't look into what that was happen what, what happened, but we noticed that something triggered this massive uh, spike in um, clock time and, and it kind of threw off all of our, um, you know, we're looking at it because everything's relative, it, you know, we we really couldn't see what was going on here. It was irrelevant because if you go back to this test, it was past the point of failure. So we don't really care about that, right? We care about that line. But you can see that uh, something really bad was happening here. Little fun fact. Didn't solve it, but just showing you. All right, so views cache. Why don't we turn that on earlier, right? Uh, duh, that's like, you have to do that because it's a separate cache. Um, it had some impact, not huge, but it helped. So what's happening here? Uh, you guys are used to this graph by now. I have two more minutes. Um, you can see. Uh, so this is a this is a comparison of what we turned down views cache 
versus before. You can still, it still gives us a lot more runway. This doesn't even look like a whale anymore. Views still consuming a lot of our um, uh, time. And we had this spike and failure starting around here. Well, the database throughput is pretty good. We don't really start seeing anything um, problematic until here. Okay, so this was the biggest surprise to me. We, you know, we, we had a num limited time to present. We had a limited time to, uh, to weigh out what we should do. We thought, well, why don't we test Percona? Percona, MySQL, Percona is a company uh, that provides MySQL performance consulting. Anybody here, Percona? Anybody using anything but uh, MySQL? Maria, okay. I would, I, um, Maria as well? Okay, so does Maria have multi-threaded uh, capabilities? Okay, it does. Okay, so perfect. So Maria probably will have the same result. The MySQL enterprise version does, the free version does not. So look at that. That was pretty surprising. We had a huge improvement in uh, performance by installing Percona MySQL. This graph looks like great, right? We only have sm small problems. Uh, again, not, not a whale. So we actually, uh, it was running so well, I had to, I had to rerun it um, with 1,000 users. We're maxing out at 500 to, to get some failure points. Um, it does, we're still not out of the woods, right? We're still running at 100% CPU usage. The loads still go up really, really high at 35, but, but it kept on responding and it kept on performing. Uh, views and special menu items are still, um, and, and the views, I'm sure, so, so this is one, one thing that New Relic, if I wish, is anybody here from New Relic? If I, if the improvement that I would love, if you could, um, when I'm looking at your, at the, this is the application level, and know that I'm, I'm Drupal, when I'm looking at um, most time consuming, um, and, and I know that's views, I wish that I could just click through views and tell me um, which view, like in this category or whatever, this, this um, module, which module, if I clicked on views, then it would take me to the database um, view with only those, that module's uh, select or insert or, or you know, CRUD statements uh, being showed up here. So I can clearly see the commerce order. I cannot get around this commerce order. So I have two options if we continue to work on a, on a, on a team with this and, and we didn't want to scale it by hardware, right? Option number one, basically eliminate that commerce order view um, from, my, um, from my pages. And, and I, I don't know whether, actually I don't know exactly whether uh, there is a, I didn't, So basically, my op my options as a developer would be to work on this module and figure out how to make it run better. So in summary, we have um, implemented Drupal Cache, which obviously had the biggest performance improvement. Uh, Memcache for anonymous for Memcache with uh, the second largest. Syslog, sadly, I wish it, it did. Uh, in our test, did not improve uh, our performance uh, so much. View, turning off Views UI really, really did. Um, and I will thank Greg Palmier on our team for uh, pushing this up front. His number one advice always is to turn off Views UI. Uh, reverse proxy in this case did not have a big uh, impact, neither did Views Cache. Um, uh, and I believe that's because how we were testing and the Percona database, and, and again, that was a kind of a last minute surprise finding, really, really did and we're really gonna move forward to, to um, using a lot more of it. Um, so I scheduled to finish at 5.45, it is now 5.47. Um, here are some resources that I put on here. I, by the way, have, um, I put all of my stuff in a spreadsheet that this is the link to, and I will put, um, so I kept track of all of our, um, all of our tests when they were run um, what scripts they, they ran, what were the results, what breakpoints they went when they broke, uh, and I've graphed all of this um, here, so all of this is um, available. I will upload my presentation to uh, SlideShare, and I'll be more than happy to take any questions that you have right now. Yes, uh, could you come up? Actually, I was told to ask people to come up to the mic so that we can record those. 
or head for the doors for the peers. Yes. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering if you could uh, elaborate on maybe why you think Views UI um, has that impact. I, my understanding was that if you were uh, an authenticated user but you didn't really have permissions to edit views or access the UI, that that wouldn't uh, really impact you. Yeah, un unfortunately, I, I can try to stipulate, but I'm not enough of a Drupal developer to give it justice. Um, I'm sur sure we'll have some blogs written up after this, and I'll I'll, um, I'll ask some of our devs to contribute to that. I'm going to guess that it's probably because it's calling some hooks or it's calling some code while that view is being, or the view is being called. I, but I. Contextual links. Just had one other one. Um, yes. Just quickly about Loadstorm. Um, we didn't really get to see the experience of building a test in Loadstorm, and I was just curious what what's involved. How is it easy? I mean, my experience with JMeter and stuff like that is it's a little tricky if you're new to it. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's a that's I I really struggled whether to keep it in. So the question whether to keep it in or to um, take it out. Um, I, I just basically didn't have enough time to cover everything, um, but. Um, let me just try to show you really quickly. It's it's a really powerful interface. Um, so building tests takes place by uh, going through your browser and basically clicking around on what you want to do, and then saving as an HR HR file. HR file. It's basically um, so if you go to your your this are, if I went to my developer tools and turned um, developer tools on and I kept track of the log. It basically keeps track of all the objects that are downloaded. I take that file, I upload it here, I create a script which then takes a number of tests and then what I can do with this script is I have really a lot of options. So one of the things that I didn't talk about also is the fact that we had to build users because we had two users logging in. So we had like I had to build like a thousand users. So what I did is I build a create an account script. I saved it. I uploaded it here. And then what you do is you parameterize this thing, and you can use. So this is a HR uh, file, and then you can just look at HTML. And then what you can do is. Um, you can modify the URLs. You can modify the forms, so you can use your own data to input your um, your in, into your forms, or you can have load serve generated for you. You can replace the query string, server URL, server the URL. I mean, it's really pretty powerful. You can also add transactions. So if you're interested in uh, if you're interested not in error rate or page, average page load, but you care about how long does it take my user to buy something or to create an account and you have an acceptable limit for that, you can create a setting there and just basically fail it at that. So building scripts is um, is fairly easy. You just, you know, it sounds like a pain to click around on your browser and upload this file, but it's not. And then running it, you basically select your scripts, you add them here, and you add the weight, and then you go into parameters and you say, I want to you know, how long do you want your test to be? How long does it have to be at peak? How many do I start with? And when? Uh, what's what's at peak? Okay. Next. Uh, yeah, I wanted to offer a theory on why um, the uh, reverse proxy cache and um, views cache didn't offer you a huge advantage. Go for and it. And I'm thinking that possibly since you started out with memcache before those, memcache has essentially caching the page. And so you're already sort of using memcache as a reverse proxy cache. And so you're not going to get as much advantage over the, the sort of uh, caching that would happen before that. That's a good point. I, so memcache does, you're right, I'm not using the database to, to cache my menus, pages, blocks, views. Okay, the view I don't is a know. Part of the page, so you have a page cache with that view already cached into it. So you're probably not going to get as big an advantage. You you might get more of an advantage on the, the the logged in users. So there's still that incremental in increase, but um, not the huge. The that huge, sounds right. The huge jump that you would expect. I think if you had done them in a different order, or if you had turned <sighs> some off, 
you would see different different results. Yes, this is true. I could have had more drama, but there's something to think about too. Thank you for that. Seriously, that that's 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 that makes a lot of sense. Yes. Great talk. Thank you very much. You mentioned you. several times that uh, PHP was a limiting factor. You didn't. And maybe I missed it. You didn't mention what version of PHP you were using. Would going to PHP 5.5 with the new opcode cache help your performance? Uh, okay, sorry. Which version? Of, I'm using 5.4.4. So you might see some performance uh, improvements by switching to 5.5 with, with the new opcode cache, and it's, it's just a lot more performant. Great. Um, but you may, did you also look into, you know, running X, XHProf and seeing if perhaps there were extra database calls that were being made or extra, you know, optimizations that could be made on the code level? It, okay, absolutely. So XHProf is, is a tool that I absolutely highly recommend. What we try to, so it, it, it basically breaks down your PHP execution and takes a look at what's really happening and, and it allows you as a developer to, hone in on where the problems are. I completely agree. Um, I try to keep this talk pretty simple. Not, not, you know, that's just kind of my approach to, to it. So we used very easily accessible tools to kind of take a look at it without really having to dive, dive too much in the code. That's kind of what I, my audience. It's mostly in, re in reference to your assertion there that PHP was your limiting factor. And so maybe there are some improvements that could lower that the resource hog on that. Yes, absolutely. And then my, my last question, I'm sorry for everyone else. No, we have time. Um, you said that these tests take quite some time to run. Um, I'm wondering if you see that there's a role in running these load tests as part of continuous integration. <laughs> you know, that's a great question too. Um, so I, I had a conversation with somebody that was running um, a sub CNN site on, um, on um, and I said they had, they had they had a lot of um, CI going on. We do a lot of CI in our shop. Um, we don't we don't do uh, load testing. And what? Okay, here's what he told me. So it, it was pretty interesting. What he said is when they run, he he doesn't do performance testing, but just by running their um, tests against their dev server, what he is able to do <laughs> is if he sees a big difference, you know, whether on the web transaction level or on the uh, server level from the previous CI or maybe the last uh, week's CI load, then he knows that he's going to have a performance issue on the server. So uh, do I see, a, 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 I think that it would be wise to do so periodically to make sure that you can still guarantee your SLAs to your customers, whoever you're servicing, if they, um, it, 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 especially if you have variant traffic, traffic, right? Um, I think this is, you know, look, looking at New Relic as your CI is kind of a, like a, a it's not, it's not really load testing, but it's a way of looking at, see if you have, you know, just a quick way of looking at your performance, right? Because what you want to do is you want to look at um, you want to look at your uh, performance over time, right? So you want to look at what happens when something changes, right? And you want to see those. That's why you, you know that's why graphs are great, right? Because <laughs> they give you tell you a story in time. So you want to take a look at a story in time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Hi. Yes. First, uh, um, I would like to share for uh, it's related to the last question. There is a lot tool called uh, Gatling uh, that you can use with Jenkins. Jenkins has a plugin for Gatling, so you can make a lot test and based on uh, the value that lot test from Gatling uh, give to you, you can fail the build or other. What is it called? Gatling. G A T L Gatling tool. It's oh, an open source lot test. That looks like a... Did you guys nice. see that? I could get a Gatling gun for sale. That was <laughs> 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 the second question is uh, if you know uh, such cache warmer module both for 
uh, Drupal cache or we use varnish and sometimes we have to uh, refresh the prime the cache what you mean like pr priming the cache uh, it's a module Drupal module that uh, warm the the cache yeah what is it called I, I don't know I, I ask him to you if oh there, there is, there is a such a, as a so um, what I have so actually this is a really good point um, what I demonstrated at one point, we had a really big failure. Um, this is this is something that. Thank you for bringing this up, and, and I hope this this helps. Really bad things can happen <laughs> uh, when you're running a stress test, and you make an insert, and all of your caches get <laughs> refreshed. So uh, generally, I didn't do it this time, but generally we do have a script that runs at a very low percentage that does update. Uh, some piece of content during stress testing so that, that ca it, it forces cash flush. Because that cash flush, basically, you know, all of the things that we did here, we assume that nobody's editing any content, right? <laughs> so what happens at content edit, your cash is, cash is flow and then like basically throws things uh, away. This is like a perfect scenario, like nobody's touching content. So um, what I have, what we've seen in, in those scenarios is, um, I mean, obviously, you know, if, if that's a problem, you have to ask yourself, you know, how how new does my content have to be? I I don't remember off offhand, but I, I remember speaking with Jeff Eaton about micro caching. So basically, they'll only refresh that piece of content that they know is uh, always changing, but not flush the rest of the cache. But I don't know the module. I'm sorry. I think it exists. I know that exists some Drupal module that uh, wore the the varnish cache, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't, I don't remember the name. I didn't find <laughs> everywhere, so sorry. Uh, cache warmer. Cache warmer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> cache warmer. The, the module is called cache warmer. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> and the last question. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I work with memcache. I love memcache. But I had a problem when we have to use more than one memcache server. Oh. Uh, because um, I think that memcache is not think as a cl for a cluster. So you have w w we have, for example, two different memcache servers, but uh, we are not able to uh, work as a cluster. So the from web server try, I know in Drupal you can define uh, an array with all the memcache server, but when he hit one memcache, he found the, the, the key, the mm -hmm. but when he hits the other memcache server, there is not the same key. So he have to um, reload the page, fill the memcache, well, are you saying, but you, I th if I recall correctly, what you do is you define, you don't have like redundant memcache servers, you define the bins and you split them up between different servers. We have three for um, three web, uh, front web servers. Sorry, for I apologize for my English. Yeah, no, let's take it. Uh, that we, we can try to talk about this. I'm actually probably not going to be able to answer your question on that. That's That's too deep for me, right? Uh, sorry? I, I probably won't be, I, I haven't set up, Cash, mem cache servers myself on multiple servers, so ah. I will. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody sticking around. It's six o'clock, two minutes after six. Sorry if we're going over. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the DrupalCon.